The next chat, ladies and gentlemen, before we go for a break, and I feel that everybody needs coffee, but the next chat will discuss what role large corporations can play in the development of the MENA VC and technology sectors. And here I'd like to invite Head of Investments at Amar, Syed Farhan Zaidi, to chat on stage with uh, Mrs. Ilham Al Qasim, the Chief Strategy and Technology Officer of Majid Al Futim. Can you hear me? Hi. Good morning, everyone. Hi. I'm Farhan. And uh, yeah, I think it will be an interesting session, especially the previous session provided a good segue of how the funding and investment activity happening in the region. Uh, I'm joined by Ilham here today. And I believe it will be an interesting and value-added uh, session for us because it will provide how large organizations like ours, uh, support the ecosystem, uh, whether it's technology, whether it's startup space. So I think let's get into the, into the discussion. So let me ask you, like, start with a question where, so, you know, you, are, you have a successful organization, uh, and I believe you guys have reached that scale because you have certain processes and procedures, our yearly KPIs, and that needs to be achieved. But how you mix that short-term, yearly KPI-driven mentality with innovation, and you know how you support it? Like because innovation is a long-tail subject; it requires efforts, diversion of resources from your other businesses. So how do you uh, marry the two concept of yearly KPI-driven, uh, you know, objectives within innovation, and how you're supporting the region? Sure, thank you so much, and it's uh, great to be here. Thank you uh, for having me. So, look, I think for me, if I, if I think about innovation over 15 or 20 years that I've been in the workforce, it started as this kind of separate thing that companies had to figure out. It's kind of this kind of pet in the room, and then there's the XCOM, and what are we gonna do about innovation? And I think we've reached a place where innovation is certainly not separate, it's one and the same, uh, with the entire organization. If I distill it to a very, very simple definition, there are many ways to define innovation. But if I bring it down to its simplicity, it's a choice, it's a culture, it's a way of being that an organization would prioritize over and above other priorities that it may have on its plate for one simple purpose, which is to achieve outsized growth and to operate at the leading edge of its particular sector. And so if I take that definition, it's not all that different, be it uh, a large or a small organization, we all need to do some of this, and it cuts across sectors. So whether you are uh, innovating in, in, in chips and in semiconductors that power our entire world as we know it today, or whether you're reinventing the way a consumer experiences the shopping mall, that same mindset and attitude and prioritization journey has to happen. Now, how do you get to be a large organization? You know, innovation itself can take two pathways. The first is a pathway in which a, a, an organization goes through a phase of innovation that serves it well and helps it reach a certain scale or a market leading position. But then that eventually fizzles out and the organization is not able to replicate that experience again. Um, and then you have the second bucket, where an organization is able to institutionalize its innovation and go at it again and again and again and continue to be at the leading edge of its industry. And I think that's the interesting question for me, right? So how do you end up in the second bucket and not the first? And for me, I think there, there are many, probably many answers depending on the sector and the experience one has, but a few thoughts that come to mind for me are kind of number one, it seems very simple, but having a strategy that is relent relentlessly focused on your core source of differentiation is key. I can't count the amount of companies' strategies that I've looked at where you see it's okay on paper, but doesn't necessarily play to the true strengths of the organization relative to its competitive environment. The second is the subject of um, talent. 
So companies who are great at maintaining innovation as part of their DNA have a relentless greed for the most talented people in their industry to converge upon their organization and focus on the problems that they have at hand. And that takes me to the third, which is you know, a willingness and an openness to allow that talent, that fresh talent, to have a go uh, at reinventing that sense of that source of differentiation. So differentiation will have to be there, but how it's expressed in the market and how your end customers, be it B2B or B2C, experience that differentiation must constantly be re reinvented. And it's only by having fresh talent looking at that same problem again and again could you possibly have a shot at uh, not being uh, sort of left behind within your industry. And then the other aspect that occurs to me is, um, you know, th the spreading of that, in that culture that I've just described across the organization rather than the concentration in one particular department. So we, you often see big companies where, you know, you have a team that do it well, but the rest of the organization is functioning very differently, and that makes it hard for innovation to continue to thrive. Um, and then the last thing I would say is every company that does this well has a secret sauce and is great at institutionalizing that secret sauce without the dark side of that, you know, the slowness of a bureaucracy taking over. It, it occurs to me that innovation or allocating capital in a large organization is a resource allocation issue because you need to divert resources. So I was reading in one of the articles, like the top five technology companies, they spend about 12% of their sales on R&D, 9% on uh, CapEx. Is there any sort of a rule that large organizations like you follow, or is it like, no, we have taken a, a strategy or we want to focus on certain sector like sustainability, it can be digitization, whatever. Is that, or, and the second related question would be, is it like top down, or is it like there are labs within large, in the U.S., there are labs and large organizations which bring innovation and then basically they start working on a certain particular uh, topic and then come out, bring out services and products. So how does it work in your organization? Sure. Look, I think an interesting tidbit. So throughout its history, Majul Fatim has invest reinvested 99% of its earnings into its growth and innovation. So, um, and, and that can be some of it very successful, some of it less so. Um, we haven't thought about it in quite that way. I think the, the key insight, considering that growth through technology has sucked the majority of our investment over the past five years or so, um, th at least what that we've learned is, you know, when you think about the investment and the investment cycle and the returns that you're expecting to get as a large organization, not just large, but an organization working in incumbent sectors that are subject to disruption, is that the criteria in which you evaluate your opportunities has to be different when it relates to innovative bets as opposed to standard growth bets in your core strength. And I think this is a space that we're still evolving, but we're very aware is important to get right uh, and is typically a downfall of a large organization that's going about this. The follow-on question on this is, so what is the method? Like, do you take on innovation or new projects in-house, or is it like you work with groups like MEVPs, like who, are, who can get the new technology, the new investments, and allow you the opportunity to look at and learn from that? What's the, pro what's the method? Is it like partnership method? Is it like acquiring uh, companies and m and What sort of a method that you guys are actually Sure, doing? sure, thank you for that. So I think, um, I'll start with the first, we do both. We do the internal, and we also do the external approach to it. On the internal side, you know, it's very simple. For us, focusing on the unmet need of the customer governs everything that we do. And then if I think about the how, funnily enough, yesterday I was having, I'm very lucky that when I talk about business immersion, I'm required to do things like visit shopping malls and cinemas. Um, but I, as part of an immersion, saw the Black Rain movie. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it. Um, where, as interesting as it is, you know, the true story of the rise and fall of Blackberry, 
for me, one important takeaway was the downfall actually really started in the values breakdown. So it break down the values of the co-CEOs around how they wanted to handle their next big challenge as a large organization or as a market leader. Um, and that takes us to, let's say, Majid Flame. You know, for us, the values is very much at the heart of how we do this. You know, we feel it's, you know, when you're venturing into space that's not your natural space, knowing what makes you tick and what makes you operate well is very important. Bold is part of our, our, our approach. You know, we've put hundreds of millions of dollars to work over the past few, few years on, in, on internal bets, and we're not shy about making those bets and believing in, in our ability to build the internal talent. Passionate is our second value. So for us, that translates into excellence. I think everyone would agree when you ex visit a Major Flame Center, the quality and the caliber of the space that's been provided or the experience is always above average. And I think that's something that we push for even in our innovative bets. And then togetherness is the third. So I think this is where we're such a large organization that the formula of how we do things together has to be smart. And sometimes that means we need to centralize efforts. And sometimes it means we need to place efforts closer to the business. And we don't shy away from making those calls in a very intelligent way. So if I take a couple of examples uh, of how that's played out on an internal bet, one that I'm very proud of is our approach on e-commerce and, uh, and omni-channel. So on e-commerce, you know, it's uh, most relevant to our retail business, Carrefour. And this is a space in which you know, we've seen incumbents around the world struggle. They've become aware, they've tried, they've deployed plenty of capital against e-commerce solutions with very varied results. And this is a space where in just a few years, Majid Flame has been able to create a massive amount of distance between itself and its competitors, uh, has been able to think and rethink the value proposition for the customers. And now that that market share, that market leadership has been attained, you know, we've moved on to think about omnichannel, which is a challenge that most global players have failed at solving. And we have a few early emerging insights that indicate success. Uh, number one of those, I would say, is the pivot of the core business. So being able to see a shop floor manager and a traditional grocery retail player embrace what technology can do for, for him in particular and to drive his P&L um, has encouraged that omni-channel approach to really come into place where we no longer differentiate between the online and the offline sales the way a traditional broker would. So. Question, have, have you allocated capital to outside VC firms or is it like the capital goes inside, remain in, in the organization for development of new yeah. concepts? So on the external side, we've done pretty much a little bit of everything. So I, I, in the first instance, we do believe heavily in ecosystems, both that within ourselves and the participation in broader ecosystems. I think with ecosystems, we see a lot of companies shy away from the ecosystem opportunity. And for me, that's mostly around knowing how to create value and really mapping out well what each player brings to the table and what they're expecting out of that, that uh, ecosystem. Partnerships are massive. You know, Major Flame has always been formed based on successful partnerships. That goes back to the same point of really understanding your partner and focusing on win-win. Um, but then SMEs and startups have been far more prevalent in our more recent investments. In 2022, we established Launchpad, which is focused on SMEs and startups in the region. The first uh, phase of Launchpad has been focused on PropTech, together with some you know, st emerging uh, startups in the uh, beauty and wellness space which is relevant to our, our traditional business. And we're really looking to grow that again this year, especially with the, th with the themes around climate tech. Um, and the way we think about that collaboration, there are many different enablers that could be on the table. One of them is investment and co-investment. We do believe that it is important to know what you're good at and partner with others, be it VC firms or otherwise, to make sure you get the outcome that you want. Um, and uh, other enablers that you know, are proprietary to us, so access to uh, uh, marketing and access to the end customer that a startup would typically struggle with is something that we can bring to the table very easily, uh, together with uh, adoption and scaling, right? So some solutions such as PropTech directly apply to our properties business, which is our, one of our biggest platforms within Majid Flame Group. And we do believe being part of the design earlier on um, helps the startup, it helps us, 
and it allows us to make smart investment decisions further down the road as the technology matures and evolves. Yeah. So what are the themes that you're following or focusing on? Is it, you've mentioned PropTech, are there anything, I think with PropTech sustainability comes into play as well. Any like the sector that you're focused on and, 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 and basic deploying direct capital as well as through funds? So I think the biggest theme by far for us is data and analytics. Uh, this is something we've been investing in for a few years, and we're really at the cusp of seeing those investments start to emerge. And the reason why I say this is because we've been sitting on arguably the most valuable and, and comprehensive data set of consumers in the region uh, possible. So we don't see any company, I, I'd be interested to hear what you think from the MR side, but uh, we don't see any company holding that data quite like us. And we've been making investments to make sure that data is in the right format and is clean to allow us to translate that into analytics and insights and real business impact. And so for us, this translates from across our value chain, from everything that starts with you know, better understanding the customer and better creating better value by better matching what a supplier of ours is targeting to what a customer needs and having a better, more valuable experience as a customer, all the way through to you know, leveraging all of that analytics into designing more of the future. So really thinking about um, how those insights on the customer would translate into reinvention of what the mall should be over the next 20, 30 years. Yeah. So this data that you think, this is obviously, we have a lot of malls as well, and the data is key here. So are you trying to develop some products based on those insights, or is it like it for your internal consumption? So we are developing products. Now the jury is out whether we will externally monetize those products. And we think about those products in a few ways. Some products are proprietary to us. Some we are open to partner on. Um, but where we are bringing our, our data to the table, we really like to think about what is proprietary to the core business versus what is scalable across the ecosystem horizontally and vertically, right? So sometimes it's not just about replicating what we do with the data, it's also about different application along our value chain. One more question, I think large organizations, they believe that they can do a lot of things on their own, uh, and it takes time because it's, you need to steer the ship and it takes time. What about your approach towards m and side of, because MEVP type companies, they have a lot of sort of a very splendid company that can be bought and in, in, uh, integrated into your setup. So is there a, a lot of time I see that organization, instead of buying a ready-made product, including ours, start developing on their own. And yeah. it takes time, it does not get the right answer, and they have already done all the learnings. What are, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? So I think we're very much open to um, taking a stake, working with VCs uh, strategically or even acquisitions. Um, I think the precursor though, or the qualifier to that statement is that incumbents are also not very good at M&A from, <laughs> from time to time. So I think having this clear focus on what is the outcome you're expecting through your M&A, because you know, we're not a VC, we're not gonna have 30 plays and hope that, you know, I don't know, uh, I think the, the gentlemen here know better, five of them end up being great and that covers for the others that are average or below average. We don't have that luxury. So we need to make sure every single play really delivers on exactly the outcome that we're going after through the tech investments. And then the second is to have a very effective stage gating. So go after plenty, but you know, really stage gate those investments so you know when it's right to accelerate or when it's right to decelerate, because you know our, our objective is, of course, financial and commercial, but the, the way that works is not through an exit, it's through an acceleration of our core business and our P&L, or the creation of a new business line. And so I think being smart about bringing the investor lens through partners such as MVP or others, um, while also being clear what our value add to the table is and making sure we're harnessing that and, and, and um, you know, really applying it to the opportunities together to achieve that ultimate outcome and not veering away through these exciting new tech that don't necessarily deliver the outcome that you need as an organization. I think for me, that's how I think about 
how large organizations or incumbent organizations should think about investing in, in, uh, in disruptors or in startups. Can you tell me something more about the launch pad that you have? Like, is it, is it like early stage, very early stage, or Series A, or what's the, what's, what's the mandate of that? Uh, early stage Series A is, like, I think, the sweet spot. And um, we leverage, as I mentioned, depending on the maturity of the company or the sector that it's in, all of the options in terms of support through the launch pad. Sometimes it's having access very early on in a company's uh, maturity to our malls, which typically are very hard to access and expensive to access. Sometimes it's access to marketing and promotion through our extensive network. Sometimes it's us, you know, as a consumer of a product or service, giving strategic guidelines or, or, or advice on their roadmap to enable the maturing of their product or their technology and ensuring it's ready to scale. And sometimes it's investment directly into the company or in partnership with other funds. I think we're done. Yeah. Thank you. Any, anybody has a question of simple nature, not a difficult one? There's no such decision at this time, but we'd love to talk about it if you have ideas. We have ideas, and we have a lot of large entities that actually rely on MMT as a public PC product. Happy to continue that conversation. That's good. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Elham. Thank you, Said. I think it's time to join the coffee crowd and. Uh, Meet uh, back here in 15, 20 minutes. See you.